I want to talk to you about some interesting stuff, but it shouldn't be stuff that surprises you, although maybe you'll, you'll find that um, a different way of looking at it changes things a little bit. But um, we are in a, a silly situation, really, that um, we as a community are far too successful, um, and as a result of being successful, are ceasing to be noticed. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. The danger of letting our achievements speak for us. I guess you recognise some of this stuff as it uh, tends to be Plymouth-based, but um, you also should be looking there at the 21st century world as well. It's, uh, it's kind of full place. People look happy and uh, they may have minor gripes about things, but life in this world is very much better than it has been in many worlds in, in, in the past. And an, an awful lot of that is down to uh, the presence of what I'm calling here electronic systems. It's not a term that you'll hear lots of people using, but it is one that's starting to grow. Electronic systems, of course, are really things which are based on electronics, but that doesn't mean to say that the only component of value that goes into them is the electronics part. But electronics has done wonderful things for us. And these are the sort of things that you see in your life around you, and you consider them pretty important. I mean, your Kindle, your printer, your camera, uh, your MP3 player, your games machines, uh, these are all the stuff that, uh, that you feel comfortable around you. Uh, it's very personal and it's valued in a personal way. What you tend not to notice is the other stuff, and these are the electronic systems which are everywhere else, because these are the ones which are in the infrastructure around you. They stop your planes crashing, they make your financial transactions happen, they give you robots for manufacturing or for health, they have en enabled the decoding of, G of DNA, uh, they handle little things like congestion charges and security at airports and uh, cars. There's a picture of my high-performance computer at the bottom left. And then there's this. And then there is the cup of tea. And I like the cup of tea because the cup of tea is, is Tesco's, really. A cup is a marvellous thing to start with. Um, the, uh, the ability to get tea and water, tea from somewhere else out in, out in the world, and water to be, to be brought there, to be available, and the energy to boil the kettle... The cup of tea represents a tremendous logistic achievement, and we take it entirely for granted. This is a different kind of electronic systems, because these ones are vital. They're vital personally, they're vital env environmentally, and they're also vital economically. If you take these electronic systems out of the world, then things do start to fall apart. Yet they're invisible. And this is the worrying thing. Because they're invisible, they are seldom valued. You don't value particularly the congestion charge system, and I suspect that you don't even think about it in the main. Similarly with your bank and your, your credit cards, they just work, you just carry on. And yet, if those electronic systems were removed, then we would have serious problems. Now, we, electronic systems we know will be our future. Um, there is a history a lesson here, and uh, it is worth remembering, because um, when people come into the world, and I don't exclude myself from this, because I did come into the world, um, what went before is assumed. What you're talking about is moving forward all the time. So back in 1960, there was not many computers around at all and they were, you're counting them in single figures. We're now talking about moving to an era in the Internet of Things where, where there will be hundreds of millions of computers around, most of them not doing what you'd think of as the role of a computer, but doing other supplementary things. Our economies, therefore, will become 100% dependent on them. So we're fairly dependent on them now, but we will be absolutely dependent on them. The population can't be maintained if you rely entirely on the historic ways of doing things. So concern about the environment, concern about health, concern about energy sources, and all of those things are all important things which will be uh, assisted through the use of electronic systems. So we'd better understand them. I think is the, is the message at this, st this stage. And I'm not talking just about you and I. I'm talking about the outside world as well. We've got to understand where they come from. We've got to understand our businesses and our activities that are involved in them. Because if we don't, we're going to become, as a nation, highly vulnerable to the influence of others. And that's always a dangerous thing. You think about energy supplies today. We're starting to run out of oil all of a sudden you realize that you're going to have to pay higher energy charges because 
you're getting it from a country that still has it when you don't have it anymore. So we have to be a bit careful because here is a big bubble and it's on the horizon. We still have opportunities to do something about it, but something has to be done about it. Now, of course, we have to ask, surely we've got this wonderful technology out there. People must appreciate it, mustn't they? Well, relative comment here, uh, Engineering UK is an organisation which is sponsored by the government and they do uh, various uh, surveys of where people go after their education, what the courses are that are popular and so on and so forth. And every year they do um, a bit of a focus area. In 2011 they did a focus area on the perception of engineering. And they had two-part question. I think it was a lovely question, actually. Uh, public perception of engineering and engineers' role in tackling climate change. Uh, when surveyed, 92% of men and 84% of women said they thought engineering would play an important part in, in this. Yeah, fantastic. They, you know, people appreciate what we do. Then you read the second part of the question. However, when asked what engineering developments in the last 50 years had had a significant impact on their lives, around 50% of people couldn't name one. Now, isn't that scary? They couldn't think of a single thing that engineers had achieved in the last 50 years which had actually impacted their lives. Of course, they're used to using all this stuff around, but they don't associate the stuff around with you and I, or with what an engineer does, or, you know, it's, it's, it's magic. Science and engineering have made the world we live in, and yet most people don't see it. They certainly don't understand what we do in it. I carry this, this piece of stone around with me, and it causes quite a lot of amusement at uh, security, especially on flights. As they, don't, they always want to know, why are you carrying a stone around? Well, it's, it's, my, it's my illustration prop, because I think that we've, we've achieved here something pretty damn spectacular. And we need to start telling people about it in terms which they can understand what we're doing and, uh, and also we can explain what we do in this context. So people are ordinary. We have to say that electronics is the pinnacle of mankind's ingenuity. We've done some pretty clever stuff, uh, uh, scientists and engineers, over the, over the last years. And I think it's some, some grounds for believing that manipulating the atom is about the most clever stuff that's ever been done. It doesn't matter, you can, the medicine and all of the rest of it is all parts of it, but this is manipulating of the atom and the electrons around it. It's fantastic stuff. And we've achieved it by standing on the shoulders of giants. It's a thing we do every day. We change that, we take apart the atoms, and we rearrange them, one at a time, into that. Now, don't you think that's just a little bit exciting? And it's, it's the sort of thing that we're so used to doing. You know, we have metals and we have elements and we have printed circuit boards and we know about integrated circuits and we know about software. And yet what we're actually doing is a hierarchical process of dismantling that and reassembling the atoms in a very careful and controlled way to produce this functional object. Pretty damn clever. But the thing about it is, it's pretty damn clever, but it's not magic. And this is a, a problem now. Because anything that people don't understand, as Arthur C. Clarke wrote, um, if you effectively, if it's sufficiently advanced, then it's indistinguishable from magic. Now, the world then out there doesn't understand that uh, a, a smartphone comes about by a laborious, progressive process. They just think it's magic. It's like, you know, oak trees happen, grass grows. Smartphones happen. You know, you, where, does the, where does the milk come from? It comes from Tesco's. You know, where does, where does the phone come from? It comes from PC World. You know, the, this is humanity. This is the people out there. And it's not to say these are the poorly educated people out there. These are ordinary people out there who don't have a scientific uh, education. <coughs> the thing we, we have to be aware of is if we are producing magic, then we are magicians. And magicians, of course, are very popular, especially when things go wrong. Because what they find with magicians is, you know, you can dunk them in water and, uh, and you can find out whether they're really good magicians or not. Uh, you can also set fire to them. Um, you know, scientists, I understand, burn a little bit brighter than engineers. But, uh, <coughs> so we don't want to get misunderstood, that's for sure. So everybody has a threshold of magic. 
Um, you have different thresholds of magic. So you have a different set of thresholds of magic than somebody who is trained in economy, for example. They presumably have a better understanding of money than we do, which is why, of course, we're in the financial situation that we're in right now. Um, but the threshold of technology magic for most people is about the level of the incandescent lamp bulb. Most people at some stage connected up a, um, a light bulb and a battery with a couple of bits of wire and they made it light up. And they can understand that it lights up because the bit of wire in there glows so hot that it gives off light. They don't really understand the details of it, but that's about the level of people's understanding. It's the same sort of reason why whenever there is a survey of Britain's greatest engineers, they always come up with Brunel or uh, they come up with Watt. Because steam engines and bolting bits of metal together are something that people can understand. They, don't, they will never uh, come up with as, uh, an engineer who is working on something which is inside an integrated circuit or as the guy who invented subroutines. You know, it's, it's way too far down there. This is way into the realms of magic. And, of course, really it's the threshold of magic that people are aware of. said that once before. Um, so we all lose... If we fail to explain the difference between magic and science, though, because it's not just, you know, we, we've had this ivory tower mentality for a long time, and I suppose I've been as guilty of it as anybody else. Um, I'm happy doing the thing I'm doing. It's exciting and it's challenging. And those people out there, they must appreciate and value what I'm doing because I'm giving them all this useful stuff. We now know that they don't. So if they're not getting, if they're not valuing what we do, then the next thing they'll do is they'll start cutting it. Because if we don't do anything useful, then it wouldn't matter if we stopped doing it, would it? So um, you cut the teaching and the research roles. So if our job's not valued, then teaching and research will end up going. Budgets will get cut for this area because it's not relevant. The technology jobs will follow. The economic contribution that it makes will go too. And the vulnerability that I talked about earlier will, will emerge. Our society will become dependent on others. We will be truly a consumer society, contributing nothing, and there isn't opportunity in the world for everybody to be a consumer. Uh, there's no money. There's no net money being made by that. You have to earn the money in some place. So we have to start to convey, and I'm, and I'm passing this over to you as a challenge as much as anybody else, because... You're all involved in your own little specialist areas, but you've got to start to explain to Joe Public what it is to, that you do. You've got to explain to your mums and dads and wives and husbands, whatever, what it is that you do. I've gone through life. My children never understood what I did. My wife has no idea what I do. Um, it's kind of just been one of those features. It's like a background. Um, and yet, she said to me a couple of times, uh, you know, well, I've said, you, you really need to understand more about science and more about the maths. And she said, why? And it's such a tricky question, because can't, I can't just walk away when my wife says why. Um, so it's, it's a difficult one, because the, the real reason is, it's important to me that you understand why. And it's got to be important to her that she understands, because it's only then that she will lobby for the money to go into the research programs, for the grants not to be cut, for the education programs to be developed, for the engineering activities to be prioritised. Not just software, hardware, robotics, control systems or whatever, but the whole of the bigger, the whole of the bigger picture. So it is an issue that you have to be involved in. We have done all that stuff. It's not really exciting. But actually, these things here are things that you probably tend not to think of. Um, involving international cooperation, involving large teams working together, globalization. These are tools of the environment, tools of the 21st century. Um, we are, it's part of the reason that we're able to create complex electronic systems like this is because we are involved in international cooperations that large teams can be effectively brought to this. That globalization allows us to make components for this in China, bring them together with components which are made in Europe and, and put them into systems or subsystems which are going to be made in uh, South Africa or some other parts in America. These, these things move around the world on average about three times before they're delivered which is a, a staggering thing, but it's enabled by globalization. International contract law, who thought that that was remotely important? Um, English as a lingua franca, franca lingua franca, I'm going to work on that. Uh, containerization, the ability to... The container is a wonderful thing, it's just like the internet. 
uh, it's hard to imagine the two of them in the same, in the same context, but in, a, in the container, you put information into the container, material, and the transport of it is invisible. The whole mechanism of picking up containers, they don't care what's inside them, they just ship them from somewhere to somewhere else. They, they appear somewhere else with effectively no costs, just the transition time in between. Uh, and it's very much the same story with the internet and IP telephones and so on. It's the cost of interfacing at both ends, which are the real money, the real uh, uh, costs in the system and the business of transportation in the middle hardly shows at all. And it proceeds at an ever-accelerating pace. And again, um, if you've got a magic view of life, magic is something which doesn't have to be evolved, it doesn't have to be maintained. Uh, grass still grows now, just the way it did when I was a kid. Uh, babies still happen in just the same way. There's been no evolution as far as those are concerned, and yet the stuff that we're doing, as far as the public is concerned, it's still just the same class of magic, don't forget. Um, that we, we still say we have to keep spending money on this. Um, when I first started work, um, I went home one night and, uh, and my wife, who was starting to talk to, talk to some of the lo local village ladies, uh, she, she said to me, what is it that you do? I said, I design telephones. So, okay. That was all she wanted. A couple of days went by and she came back. Uh, I came home one night and she said to me, um, but we've got a telephone. And it's, it was one of those irresistible arguments. Yes, you're right. So I'm designing telephones, but we've already got one. You know, why do we want to improve the telephone? It's ordinary person. I tell you, she's an English and history teacher. She's not a scientist. Uh, it's an exciting story, so it shouldn't be a difficult story for us to tell. But I'm going to give you some idea of, of that exciting story. Life before science. We are Cro-Magnon man. It's hard to think of ourselves as cavemen, but we are pretty well. Cro-Magnon man, 35,000 years ago, emerged out of Homo sapien. Uh, the mission purely was survival. If you took a Cro-Magnon man 35 years ago, run him through today's education system, put him in today's environment, he would be no different to you or I. Normal variations excluded. For between 35,000 and 2,500 years ago, not much went on. Uh, but the philosophers emerged at that sort of time. Presumably there was enough food around that they had, to, they had the opportunity to think about why, as opposed to where the next meal was coming from. Uh, but their mission was essentially try to understand a little bit about nature. Third phase as a scientist, 1,000 to 500 years ago, who started to say, well, we know a few things about the uh, characteristics of materials, what happens when we manipulate them but they still weren't interested in real useful things. So you look at Galileo's steam engine, the ball with the two little jets pointing out of it. It's a wonderful demonstration of something, but it's not actually coupled to a loom or anything like that. Uh, he wasn't selling them in large quantities. He may have made a couple of for amusement purposes. But it, was not, it wasn't really, it was demonstrating that he could do something with the characteristics of material rather than something which is particularly valuable. But it was the engineers who made an appearance 260 years ago, just 260 years ago, just eight generations ago, with the Industrial Revolution. Because that was when um, technology effectively first made its way through to the masses. So people started to be interested in it. So, so 30, 32,000 years of engineering, without engineering if you like, got us as far as that. That's where we were for the first 32,000 years of our environment. At the end of that time, these are the technologies that we developed. It wasn't very impressive. Things didn't go very far with a strategy that says, if it's good enough for my dad, then it's good enough for me. If it's good enough for my mum, it's good enough for me. So it was the, the breakthrough of the Industrial Revolution was unleashing the power of this science by delivering it in a way that satisfied a volume need, which we now would call business. And in fact, it... It created the consumer, and it created money. There was money before this, but it was used essentially by kings and lords for, for mana, uh, massaging large, part, large parts of, ex, uh, of their estates. But money was not something that people had, ordinary people. But when people wanted to buy something, then you had to give them the mechanism to buy it. And so money was one of, the big consuming uh, one of the big features of the Industrial Revolution. And it literally did begin here in the UK, and it spread through Europe, North America, and eventually the world. 
There are various features about it, some of which you'll recognise from the history books, but I guess because you're here as scientists, then most of you missed the history lessons because uh, it wasn't really that interesting. Actually, it turns out to be quite interesting. Um, had the profound effect on socio-economic and cultural conditions, and really for the first time, living standards uh, for the mass of ordinary people went, sus underwent sustainable growth. Not just living standards, but living now, of course, the atom and the exploitation of it really only happened about 1940, not so very far before I was born. Um, and it says that this whole electronic stuff has happened in my lifetime. So the thousand generations that went before didn't get nearly as good as this. This, from the valve to the integrated transistor, has been a pinnacle. I got it just right. But I guess you're going to have something interesting as well, so don't worry. Happened in the span of one lifetime. Gordon Moore, we know Gordon Moore. Everybody knows Moore's law. Uh, but do you know that when he, uh, when he designed it, he was designing a chip which was eight transistors. He designed a chip which had eight transistors in it. He'd just done one which was 16. Uh, and they were working on one which had 50 transistors on it. That's the, that's the scale of integrated circuit that he was designing with in those days when he coined this small. Well, actually, he didn't coin it. It was coined much later by a, uh, a magazine, electronics magazine. But nevertheless, the concept has carried us forward, and we know about Moore's Law, and we know about the pace of it, but it's still awfully easy to forget some of the details of it. For example, ARM was born back in 1991, when we were do doing a transistor, an integrated circuit which had about a million transistors on it. Now we're talking about being able to buy a memory card which has got uh, 20 billion transistors on it for less than a fiver. That's 20,000 times more functionality on a piece of silicon now than when ARM started. Now ARM started only 20 years ago. This is recent stuff. 20,000 times more functionality in 20 years. Now, if you want to explain about what we've been doing, you don't build 20,000 houses or, a, or a, ta a skyscraper which is 20,000 times bigger by using the same technique as you use for a small thing. You have to have different techniques, different me methods, different approaches, and that's what we've been working on. Now, of course, the other thing that we're, we're used to is transistors. Well, maybe you are, maybe you're not. Maybe you write code, or maybe you think in terms of circuit blocks or... Uh, or um, functions, but somewhere down there are transistors. They underlie whatever we do, and uh, this is thanks to Asen Asenov in Glasgow, who models the atomic level uh, behavior of transistor circuits. Now, you can see on the top right over there the actual impurity atoms which are put into a transistor these days at the level of a 30 nanometer transistor. We're already working on 14 nanometer transistors, so this is already out of date. Um, but you can see, so here are all the atoms with, uh, with the impurities put in it. You can certainly see that the size of a transistor is getting down to the bumpy stuff. But how small is an atom? Anybody got any idea how big an atom is? Not really. You know it's small. I mean, you know you can't see it when you scratch something and have a good peer under a microscope. It's still not visible. So you know it's pretty damn small. Well, actually, you can take 3,000 of today's transistors and you can put them side by side in the thickness of a banknote. You think about the thickness of a banknote, well, you don't normally think about it. It's just there, isn't it? It's, it's pretty thin. 3,000 side by side. A few hundred billion on a chip to this year and twice that number next year, thanks to Moore's Law, and twice that number year after. It's a staggeringly large thing, but if you want it to look at the size of the average picture that you take on your smartphone, then if that's the edge of your banknote, that's your banknote, then a picture is a square of silicon about the size of uh, the thickness of your banknote. It's pretty small. Of course, it does really take up space. You know, a picture, when you take it, when it's on that memory card, does occupy a certain amount of physical space. It's a very small amount of physical space, but it's there. Now, of course, we are talking about real transistors, and we're talking about real devices, and here's a, uh, an NVIDIA Tegra 3 processor, which has about a billion transistors on it. Now, a billion transistors, a thousand, a thousand times more 
than the million transistors that we were um, we were talking about in the in ARM startup day. So we're already making uh, pretty big chips here, and there's five cores which are illustrated on there, which are ARM, and I'll come back to that later. But to give you an idea again on scale relative to the earbud, most of you are familiar with this, man in the street, not necessarily. But when you start to push down and look inside it, you see, of course, one billion transistors actually are connected together. Down here, there's one, there's another. Uh, I can't see another one. I think there's another one up here. But those are real transistors. And when you, when you make that integrated circuit with a billion transistors on it, see how complicated it is to wire up just three of them. And there's a billion in there, a thousand million. That's a lot of transistors, a lot of circuits to be connected, circuits to be designed, circuits to be verified, functionality to be achieved. A lot of activity, a lot of excitement down there, and it only happens because of detailed in, in, in investigation. Um, Moore's law was saying this, and it really show, shows two curves here, which, is, which are not terribly well illustrated. One of them is the top blue line, which shows the doubling in, in transistor density every 18 months. The bottom one, on the other hand, showed what the design tools were doing. I emphasize this is a 1999 graph. Nothing, ever, nothing as useful has been produced by anybody in the meantime, so I keep using it. It shows that back here, when ARM was created... It was around 100 person years of effort to confirm that what you designed was what you intended to design. But it also showed that as we moved out towards 2009, 2010 even, we were talking about the gap in productivity going up hugely. And of course, not only in productivity, but also in the verification to confirm that what you what you've actually designed is what you intended to design. Huge, huge efforts were predicted there, but what happened to them? Where did they go to? I mean, we should have, by now, very serious problems about productivity, and yet we don't seem to have. We're still producing chips and we're still producing systems. Ideally, every, according to that prediction at least, everybody would have been tied up doing the work associated with it. And what happened was another revolution. And the thing about revolutions is you don't realize about them, usually, until afterwards. And so most people didn't notice the productivity revolution because it kind of crept by year after year. Increasingly now, everything that you buy as a product incorporates increasingly large amounts of reuse in it. You don't do almost anything from a clean sheet of paper anymore. It makes incremental design possible. It supports design partitioning and bigger design teams, allows higher level of abstraction and languages, use of synthesis tools, methodology, procedures, and quality. Well, a lot of boring stuff in there, but actually it also is enabling us to, to make very much reduction in design effort to produce a new thing. If 90, 99.5% of a product, of your next product, can be based on what you've already done, then the scale of the design challenge is much less, but still big. A 5% of a billion gate transistors is still a 5 million gate design. It's not a trivial design challenge. It just means that there's an awful lot of it that you don't have to do to focus on that thing which will give you product differentiation. Now, compute engines turn out to be a really useful way of helping with reuse. Because they, uh, these things, memory, uh, complex on-chip circuit blocks, uh, re software code, which is, com uh, which is compatible, of course, with ROMs and uh, SRAM, it enables teams to focus on, on producing, or it enables larger teams to focus on, on, on fractured uh, design challenges, but it also need, means, as far as the chip is concerned, you've simplified some of the design part of it by being able to put regular structures on it, or structures which have been used before. Again, productivity argument. Now, when we talk about computers, it's very, think, very tempting to think about the thing which you sit in front of uh, on your desk, type and wiggle the mouse of and look at a screen. But, of course, we also know that that is a computer, too. Not quite the same thing. We also know that um, engine management systems are computers and modems are computers. We know this. The world in general doesn't know this. So what is a computer? Well, at least at one level, it's a, it's a mathematical uh, engine, uh, incorporates uh, state, but it's essentially independent of technology. 
Hardware and software don't really make an appearance in this. It's an exercise of solving an equation, and the equation is, has got a real-world meaning. So it's something which a consumer is prepared to pay for, ultimately. So people don't buy solutions to equations. They look for something which is going to deliver value to them. Now this, as far as we know, is the earliest computer. 87 BC, um, it wasn't really uh, engineered in any sense, it was a demonstration of something which was possible, but it was essentially able to work out the position of all the planets. Very much a one-off creation, uh, Hyperchoros, I can't really say the name even. Um, the, real, the first real machines started to appear with the Orrery, a planetary motion computer, and this one really rather surprisingly is around the time of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and if you look at it, it's a computer, it's computing the, the planet, planetary positions, and the technology which is enabling that computation is mechanical. Don't underestimate that. It isn't easy to produce a gear wheel, it isn't easy to make them fit together, and anybody who thinks it is, just sit down for, for a little while with a file and a piece of metal and think to yourself, I want to produce a gear wheel out of this. If you didn't have the piece of metal or you didn't have the file, it's just that much more difficult as, again. On top of that, you have things like Babbage's difference engine. This is a machine which was designed to calculate log tables. Log tables, uh, something that you don't tend to use these days, but was certainly very much a currency when I was in school, uh, to do complex calculations, um, long divisions and multiplications were just, were just too difficult, really. Uh, log tables made it viable. Uh, but log tables had to be calculated, and they used to have a room full of people calculating them by hand. This was a machine uh, which was able to calculate them. Now, of course, the only slight problem here was it was actually a very difficult technology, and although it was invented as a machine, it wasn't until around the year 2000 that it became possible to implement this machine. Principally, the backlash on and all of the gears made it impossible. So he, here was a guy who designed a machine which was actually beyond the level of technology which is able to support it in those days. Uh, Enigma, you've heard of Enigma, it's a mechanical computer for encoding and Colossus which is the other end of that which was, uh, try which was trying to decode the, uh, uh, the encoded messages. And this one is heading towards st starting to see some uh, electronic technology in the form of valves uh, helping to speed up the process but it's very much an ele uh, electromechanical product you can see there from the tape memory and input device that is, that's the memory over there running around between the wheels um, baby, 1947, I was born in 1949, so we're getting close here. Valves and software technology, first general purpose computer, so a computer that the algorithm wasn't built in and, Im and unwirable. You mustn't forget things like the analog computer. The initial space programs were done using analog computers because the calculations were too difficult to do it any other way. Um, so the, the game of moon landing and so on literally were using computers which were very much like that to do the calculations of when they should do the thrusts and so on. So now we're looking perhaps at the pinnacle of computing technology. Is this the pinnacle of computing technology? Or is that the pinnacle of computing technology? Uh, or is the cloud the, computing, the pinnacle of computing technology? The answer is, of course, we don't know. Look at the evolution of radio. You could still recognize that that was a radio and that was a radio. Different vehicles altogether, but the, this thing managed to extract a signal from the air, and if you had a pair of headphones on it, you could listen to the signal. At a, at a top level view, the one on the right does exactly the same thing. If you look at the architecture of even a fairly simple radio, moving away from the very left-hand model, they all have RF amplifiers, mixers, IF amplifiers, limiters, discriminators, amplifiers, audio amplifiers. They, are, they have an architecture which has stayed remarkably the same. Not surprisingly, they're actually doing a mathematical computation. And there are ways of doing a mathematical computation. So here's a valve implementation of that maths. Here's a transistor implementation of that maths. Here's an integrated circuit implementation of that maths. The block diagram is much the same, slightly rearranged. So the answer is, all of those are computers. There is only input-outputting and processing. The rest of it 
it's time related architectural decisions we're trying to do something, we're limited by the technology which is available at any time and the correct answer is the answer which is the correct mix of all of those processing options which are available to deliver a product I'll come back to the product so the public image of a cool icon I know instantly if you want to be knighted then you need to be somebody like this because Jonathan Ive it says in the press here and I guess they know uh, he's been the brains behind many of Apple's products a load of isn't it because this guy is a stylist he designed the outside of the case he's responsible for the the idea of icons having a three-dimensional look he is responsible for the uh, the behavior so the ability to drag and drop things around and what happens but he's not responsible for what went on inside the case the technology was something which was beyond him and yet if you look at the back of what it says on an iPhone it says it's designed in California and assembled in China which also says if you don't live in California or you don't live in China then as far as those two areas of this successful product is concerned you've had it so the UK has had it we have apart from exporting Jonathan Ive to America where he's able to do this wonderful design work then uh, you know the UK has lost, lost the plot entirely there's no opportunity well the problem is that, of course you know that actually it's cool at many levels inside there are many levels the fact that it has an inside is a mystery to people most people literally do think an iPhone is solid uh, it gives all the impression of being solid uh, but even if, when you start to take it apart before we get ex excited about the electronic technology or anything else like that you look at the little vibration motor and you think to yourself this thing had to be designed it had to be manufactured it had to be it had to be created how do you do that well of course you do it with robotics you do it with other machines the camera a wonderful video camera and a still frame camera with LED and it's something which is um, eight millimeters by eight millimeters by six it's tiny and it didn't just grow on a tree people are surprised to discover that these things have actually exist inside there they thought it was one chip and they thought it was a chip that was designed years ago by somebody um, and into the modules there are modules because the control board you take apart the control board and you find that there are lots of chips not even just one chip that surprises a lot of technology people instantly there are 20 chips inside the average iPhone and they're designed by all sorts of different people and some of them incorporate arm technology whatever that means and we'll come back to that and the board isn't one-sided it's two-sided and that's quite an achievement isn't it how do you assemble a board like that how do you make something and make it work and all of those other companies which are involved again and if you look inside the chip the big chip which is the A4 chip which is supposedly the processor chip the heart of this then you'll find that even inside that package which is only four millimeters top to bottom mounted on the board there are three die wonderful technology this is a cross-section through it again technology which had to be designed implemented created by somebody by some groups working together to produce this wonderfully sophisticated smart uh, smartphone that we take incredibly for granted there's a lot of stuff in a smartphone at a block level diagram that's what's in a smartphone so there's lots of designers involved globally but I wonder how many realize how many Apple don't normally disclose this information but they were being accused of being um, somewhat parochial about their uh, design efforts and so they listed what they call their tier one suppliers which are the primary people who supply technology to them there are 159 of them on that list thousands of designers involved behind that list tens of thousands of engineers involved behind that list to make a smartphone to make an, an, an iPhone they're all around the world and interestingly although ARM is a primary supplier into a lot of the chips inside an iPhone we're not on that list we're not a tier one supplier we're a tier two or a tier three supplier we're a supplier of components into the suppliers of components who are supplying components into the modules which eventually Apple assemble into an iPhone so there's a, a lot of depth to this we talked about reuse and productivity it's a couple of numbers just to titillate the mind we are still producing only around a hundred to a thousand gates or lines of code per day 
That's a very low level of productivity, but that's about the level of productivity of a human in a design environment. We're talking about tested, verified, incorporated lines of code here. So you can write a thousand lines in a day, but you then have to test it and check it and all the rest of it and get it released. And the productivity has not changed hugely. Typical designs have 50 to 100 persons a year of effort to do a design, ch- to, to do a product. That's still a pretty big number. 100 person years of effort to design the next product is 100 people employed for one year or 50 people for two years. It's a large amount of effort, but it tells you that actually we can only just about afford 0.5% of new stuff in a product. It's not possible to do clean sheet, de- clean sheet design, and it's not been possible since about 1995. 1990 was when ARM was born, to give you an idea. That also means then that we've, we went through the reuse methodology about that time, because before that time, it wasn't necessary to reuse. In many respects, that was why ARM succeeded, because it happened at the time when people needed to do reuse, we had a product which was available, which was essentially reuse. It's not just in the chips, it's the other stuff too. There's lots of it, but I won't go through it blow by blow or I shall run out of time. So how much reuse do we need? Well, we need lots of it. And um, the reason I say this is that you've got to think about this because it's not just about doing new exciting stuff. It's about making sure that what you've done, you package away and you let somebody else do. The world has got lots and lots of excitement. There will always be a new challenge for you. Don't be afraid of letting go. Pass on what you know how to do to somebody who's better at implementing it than you are. Continue pushing forward the frontier if that's what turns you on. There's plenty of frontier. We've not started very far. We've not gone far down this road. There's lots of opportunity for for people to extend what they do. Move on. But to move on, you've got to encourage people to pick up what what you've provided and use it. So it's important that it's the thing that you've provided makes it through to, uh, to people who are going to design products based on it or use, or use it to design products. A significant part of this, and this is the comfort factor for you, a significant part of reuse is and will remain knowledge-based. There is never going to be a shortage of opportunity for people who are good, good scientists, good engineers, The designer has done similar work before, is always going to be valid. The team has a collective experience. The company has experience. The role of the design engineer is to create order out of chaos. You're given a a spec for a a, a module or an object or a phone or whatever. It's a spec. It's a loose specification. Your role is to convert it into a precision description to allow something to happen in a predictable, repeatable way. That's always going to be a human activity. Machines can help you, but they will never replace you. Now, a, a thing then that you, you've got to understand, and I think that certainly politicians and an awful lot of people don't understand, there is a world of difference between a product and a technology. Products are things that people buy, ordinary people. Uh, transport, energy, entertainment, health, security, communications. I mean, there's lots of products, specific products inside each one of those areas. But it's something that you buy. You reach into your pocket and you pay your hard-earned for and you go away because it gives you something in that area that you want. Now, technology is a cross-cutting thing. Technologies enable many products. It's a, a fundamental of a technology. If it only enables one product, it's very narrow. It usually means you have a lot more difficulty getting it uh, accepted. But basically, optics finds its way into all of those. Software, microelectronics, I've only listed three. There are many as you want them to be. And interestingly, there are some products, tools, robotics, uh, capabilities, which effectively are not end products in their own right, but help you to make products. So robotics is an interesting one because it goes back on itself as well. Because, of course, robotics can help you to make robots. and it's a, uh, It becomes self-sustaining activities. But science does not equal technology. There's an awful lot of push these days for getting science out of university into industry. I'm sure that uh, you've heard this. <laughs> It's a, it's a big push, and yet it's totally misguided, because the assumption is that technology is a product, just waiting to be finalised, dusted off a little bit. It's not. Technology, which is the 
robust version of science, and science is what most research uh, groups in universities produce, Technologies are science which have been polished to a point at which you can uh, use it in a mission-critical environment in a business. Businesses don't want to take risks. They want to use what they know how to do to create products. So they need, businesses need technology, but the technology only enables them to develop products. Products are the things that sell. So we need to look at products, because a product is undoubtedly more than technology. It's businesses are money-making machines. Um, people who forget that usually make big assumptions. Politicians have forgotten it even recently. Um, they still keep coming back and saying, you guys have got to be more socially aware. Why? That's not what we're there for. We're there to make money. We're there to make money out of knowing what we know how to do. Not know, out of knowing what we don't know how to do. That's just foolish. There are plenty of businesses that don't make money, they don't last very long. So only the ones that, uh, that make money are the ones that survive. And so they have to have a business model. They have to sell stuff that people want to buy, and your people. Uh, so you know that you, you've got your people hat as well, and you look at the things that uh, you're making, or thinking about making, or think how your technology might, or your science might ultimately apply to it. And you've got to think, how does this translate to something that I, in my domestic life, might buy? Because if you can't think of it, then you probably aren't going to sell it either, uh, because people out there who, who want to buy it for its functionality will not be looking at it, uh, the possibility of buying it because it's of its technology. Businesses need product differentiation. Uh, we don't need perfection. We just need to be better than our competitors. Uh, we just, you know, all the time, if every generation of our product can be a little bit better than our competitors, that's all we need. Actually, second is for losers. Don't let anybody tell you that there is a lot of uh, value in being second. There's no value in being second. There's certainly no value in being third. If you're first, you've got the market to yourself, and you can, you can charge what you like for it, and, uh, and you can be a leader. Otherwise, you're competing for the, uh, for the, for the, uh, the crumbs, and you don't want to be that. Businesses should never aim... To, to go for second place or anything. Governments want us to do it all the time. So new products then, from a business point of view, are just expensive and risky, and therefore a cost to be minimised. So when you get out into industry, one thing you find is that immediately you haven't got enough resources to do what you are being asked to do. Oh, it's the same thing in university, I'm sure. But because it's essentially a risk, then what you're... What what your company wants you to do is not to design something new and exciting, but to take as much as you possibly can of something they've already got, change it slightly, but make it uh, differentiated from the competition. You know, Apple did an amazing job at one stage uh, when they came back into the uh, market of, uh, of the desktop by styling the case. They didn't do anything inside the box, they just made it into a semi-transparent case. It became a sexy thing, and it sold. Now, technology-wise, that wasn't a development, not a real product. The problem is, product is not about technology. Product uses technology. Globalization is an interesting twist on all of this, too, because it means that we can't... You can compete now. Um, we, we buy supply for from wherever we can get it. We buy components from wherever they're cheapest, we get people to help us in the assembly of these components, we even get people to handle the shipping. We only end up pretty well doing the marketing, because everything else can be outsourced to anywhere in the world where it makes most effective sense to be put. The, this is a, seen as a big threat, of course, because it means that if you've got a little component company just down the road in Salt Ash, and you've got a, a factory here, and you can actually get components from China cheaper, then you're going to use the components from China, because your product has to be competitive in the world. You can't afford to take higher, pr higher price ones or lower quality ones from Salt Ash, just because it's local. You've got to have a product which is world compatible. compatible. Um, but the thing about it is, so are the opportunities. And this is a, a thing which most people don't grasp wholeheartedly. Your competitors are global, but your opportunity is global as well. But think of it as a personal level too. Your competitor is, gro is global. The guy who's going to be doing your job when you get out there into, in, into industry or when you're doing it, 
in, in the research lab in university. The guy who's competing with you is somebody out there. And if he's doing a better job than you are, then you've got to start thinking about what you're, what you're doing. It's a very personal thing, but it also accounts for why there's a lot of people on the streets who don't know what to do these days, because they are also in competition with other unskilled people out there in the world. Be good, plan to be good, plan to be the best. So we're at the start of the dawn of the electronic systems age. You might think, well, what's that then? Well, I've given you some examples of the mechanical, electrical, microelectronics, and what I'm saying now is electronic systems is the next agenda here. The electronics age is roughly 19, 1975 to 2005, and we're now starting on the electronic systems age. It will probably take us forward till about 2030. A scale as anything to go by. And if you go back, then you can see that the Wood Age and the Stone Age and the Bronze Age and the Iron Age are all out there somewhere. These were technologies which were brought to bear on human problems in their, in their respective times. And all we're doing, we're still that 35,000 year old human, Cro-Magnon man, we still are driven by the same needs and if people can help us to get those needs satisfied by using technology a little bit better than their competitors, then we're doing, we're doing well. So what does ARM do? I've mentioned it a couple of times. You can read that as well as I. You probably don't realize that ARM has shipped 40 billion CPUs in things like this since it came into existence 22 years ago. We're planning on, on shipping 150 billion by the year 2020. That's a large, large increase. And these, these are marketing figures, which means that they're not fiction. They're based on surveys and information, and we have a lot of customers to base that information on. So that figure is a very real one. We don't know what people are going to use them for, but we can see the growth, you can continue the growth, and you can know the type of things that they're going to use them for. Internet of Things, everything connected to everything else. The concept of ARM is not all that difficult. It's a simple CPU. You don't need to, uh, to study that one. The idea was that rather than making it available as a, as a separate chip, you make it available in a Lego brick-like way, bolt it together to make a system, rather than uh, people have to design it from scratch. Now that meant that instead of putting those chips on separate printed circuit boards, which you would have had to do in the past, you can put them on a chip. It's a simple idea. But the package was supported by a business model, which was a uh, cost-sharing business model, and essentially meant that we sold this, con this concept to people, but they didn't give us the money until they were successful. Now, the measure of success, I suppose, is that we're now talking about, on that previous one, it showed five arms. Here's a chip which is not, the same, not for the same product, not for the Apple product, at least, but this one's got ten processors on board. It's a case of what do you do with a billion transistors. Processes, as we know, are places where you can uh, execute software. Software is just a way of using hardware. It's a, it's a way of allowing large design teams to, uh, to, to address a problem and for problems to be fragmented. But here we're talking about 11 processes, sorry, 10 processes on a single chip. And that's not the only chip that's going to be in the system. So there's probably going to be four or five other processes elsewhere in the product which is going to use it. Now, of course, it's fine to say let's create the processes, but unless you've got a methodology, the software, the CPUs and the GPUs, the interconnect systems, the way they ha all hang together, the IP, the blocks, the actual components which are, which are going to be there at a the silicon level, those are all things that people need to know. They need to have those pieces of information, those tools, those methods available to help them to deliver their systems. And the attraction, of course, of having a very large licensee base is that we, we license our technology to people. So we're selling knowledge and know-how and reuse methodology and accessing, therefore, millions of developers. So although we're shipping 44 million ARM CPUs today, we don't make any. We have no manufacturing. We don't design any full chips. We only tell people how to do them. And it's moved us from a barn in Cambridge with 12 engineers, which spun out of the Computers in Schools program back in 1981, which has roots in the University of Cambridge back in 1975. These take a long time to move forward, but of course not many years when you think of the 35,000 years of lifetime. And now we are 
in 90% of the world's smart electronic systems, 95% of the ones which are being designed today are being designed based on ARM. 75% of all the devices connected to the internet are ARM based, which all of a sudden means that the internet is a vehicle to support ARM sales. Just think about that. We've taken over the internet. A little UK company. 8.7 billion sh CPUs shipped last year, 20% up on the year before, which was 20% up on the year before that and 20% up on the year, after, uh, year before that. Um, 50 times the number of all the PCs that have ever been shipped, we've shipped, ARM CPUs. We're a FTSE 100 company, which makes us one of the biggest companies in the world, in the UK, sorry, small world. Uh, but we only have 2,400 people big worldwide. We're only a small company, 800 in the UK. But of the 800 people in the UK, 90% of the, of the uh, sorry, of the 2,400 people worldwide, 90% of the staff have got a first degree, 60% have got a master's or higher. So we're a fairly highly skilled company. It's not a business model that scans to the uh, uneducated masses, I'm afraid. Um, so we don't have a big factory. We, won't have, we will not have a big factory either. And more than 90% of our revenue is foreign earnings. Only half a percent of what we get, we sell in the UK. And we're doing quite well. Pay rises, share options, modest bonuses. I have to say modest there, just so that we're not on the same scale as the bankers. 70 vacancies in the UK today. Good opportunity there. The innovation and efficiency underpins it all. And as I really said, our role now has moved on a little bit from being purely the provision of a CPU cell to helping people to design electronic systems. These complex electronic systems products want to help them to be productive, economical, and the results to be reliable. Reuse and hardware software, software methodology. It's all kind of academic. But it's very real because it's got very real value. People say, what's the, uh, what's the future? Where do we go? Well, it's, again, it's fairly obvious. If you take your techie hat off and you put your ordinary person in the street hat on, then these are the things that you dislike about the electronic products that surround you. They're all about reduction and removal of the technicalness of the product and the increase of the transparency. People just want to see us even less. And society's challenges, urbanisation, health, transport, energy, security, environment, food, water, ageing, society, sustainability, digital inclusion, economics, all of those things. Remember I started off by saying how people figured that engineers were going to be important in solving those things. Well, actually we're not. We're going to help people by giving them the technology to solve those things. Undoubtedly, whatever solutions will come about will be dependent on electronic systems. But the electronic systems aren't going to solve the problems. The problems are predominantly social. They're key enabling technology. It will be a necessary part of it, but they're not the solution in their own right. So, some conclusions, very briefly. Some point as I want you to take away. Electronic systems are a growing feature of our lives today, and they will underpin society and our economy tomorrow. It's important we understand and maintain our presence in their global life cycles. Nobody owns electronic systems. No company, no country, no nationality, anything like that. They are products of the world. We have to maintain a valued part of that life cycle. That way we avoid uh, over-dependence on individual countries. You have to carry that message forward. Electronic systems technology is magical, but m not magic. We have to go against here. Uh, it's, it seems wonderful to be known as magicians, to be purveyors of magic, but actually all the time that we're doing this, we're doing ourselves a disservice. So we have to explain to people that what we do is actually rather boring. Uh, it's important, it's precise, it's repetitive, it's detailed, it's clever, but it's not magic. Unfortunately, clever is a difficult one. It's nice to explain that you are, I'm cleverer than you are, but the, the recipient of that wisdom is usually not very happy. Uh, and if they're bigger and more muscular than you, then you get your ass kicked. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have to keep quiet about the clever a bit, not, not to overemphasize it. But we have to say that, you know, what we're doing is pretty specialized, but it's not magic. 
Our advances are painstaking and precise. They emerge from the efforts of global networks of physical and, physical and knowledge contributors. The simplest life forms are still way above anything that we know how to do. Do you know there are people out there who believe that we know all the answers and that we're releasing the information a little bit at a time to maximize the value? Yeah, we're scientists, we know all the answers. We, we know how to do this, you know, we've, we clearly know about life, we've decoded the genetic code, whatever that means, and we've you know, got all these cures for cancers and all the rest of it, but we're not going to release it just now because we can maximize our value if we release it a bit at a time. You know, it's part of the misunderstanding. It's important to explain ourselves to the public because they need us. They need us to build and maintain the 21st century. It's as bad as that. The 21st century, whatever it becomes, will be highly dependent on what we do. Uh, but we need them to support us too because they're the ones who ultimately give the politicians the mandates to, uh, to release the money to make sure that that uh, primeval swamp from which the knowledge and opportunities will arise happens and flourishes and grows and it starts with education, research and finance and it leads to the creation of jobs and economy obviously. Interdisciplinarity, the boundaries are a negative influence. We've got to break down the barriers. These are administrative barriers which have been introduced for purely administrative reasons but they cause huge uh, dis disunity and that's something which we don't need right now we've got to know ourselves as all in this together so thank you very much for listening um, I hope that the message has got over that technology has stopped talking for us and we've got to start talking ourselves now we've got to start talking to people those people out there in the streets not talking down to them talking up what we do but talking about it in a way that they can understand Thank you very much for listening.